Welcome to Cross Community Church. My name is Anna, and I want to thank you for spending part of your weekend with us today. And before we begin, I'd like to take a moment and share with you who we are as a church. Our vision says this, we want to help people believe in Christ, belong to a church, and become a disciple of Christ. If you're joining us today and you don't have a personal relationship with Him, it is our prayer that you would get to know Him during this next hour because that is what it is all about. And now, before we hear from our senior pastor, Randy Eaton, let's worship the Lord together.
Jesus Christ is with us. Amen. And he's coming again in his glory. So we look forward to that. Would you step out of your seats today and tell somebody Merry Christmas? As you're taking your seats this morning, I'd just like to welcome you all here. I'd like to welcome all of our online viewers as well. Uh, my name is Kimmy Barnett, and if you are new with us, especially during this holiday season, we are sincerely so glad that you are here at church. Can we please welcome all of our guests this morning? If you are new, we want to learn just a little bit more about you. Maybe you have a, an area in your life that we can pray for, so I would just encourage you to take a moment, grab that in-touch card. It's right in front of you. Fill it out. Hold on to it for the remainder of service, and then as you exit this morning, you're going to walk right by the welcome desk, drop it off. We have a special gift for you to take home. Ladies, happening tomorrow night, Monday, December 6th, we are having our annual Christmas charity soiree. This is a very special event, and it's going to be just full of fun. We're going to have a coffee bar and desserts. We're also going to have a $5 ornament exchange. So if you plan on coming, pick up a $5 ornament, wrap it, bring it here, and then we're going to have an exchange game to play. The cost for the event is a $15 gift card to a local grocery store or gas station, such as Walmart or Publix. And what we do is we hold on to those gift cards, and then throughout the year, as individuals and families are in need, we distribute them to them. So ladies, join us for this very special event. Men, we haven't forgotten about you either. In a couple weeks, you're going to be having a manly game night happening on Friday, December 17th at 6 p.m. There's going to be cornhole and card games. You're even going to have a build-your-own subsection as well as drinks. So please be sure and gather with the men on Friday, December 17th. And finally, in just a few short weeks, we are going to have our one of the best Christmas Eve services you can find in town right here, uh, December 24th at 6 p.m. We have special music, we'll have a live orchestra, and we'll have our kids uh, choir up here on stage. So join us uh, for Christmas Eve. And now I'd like to welcome uh, Marcus and Zamira Silva up here as we continue in our worship with the lighting of the Advent candle. Hi, everyone. Last week, we lit the candle of hope. And this second Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of peace. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and the fruit of His presence is peace. Galatians tells us the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Christ comes to bring justice, wholeness, and harmony to all creation. He wants to continuously grant us peace in every situation. Before he ascended to heaven, he told his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. John 14:27. Lord, we pray that you will guide our feet in the path of peace. Amen. Ransom captive. 
praise him through the cross he bore for me, for you. to Jesus. He is our King. He is our Lord. He is the promised one, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. He is the one we have been looking for. And if you're looking for a Savior today, you will find him in Jesus Christ. Amen. How many of you have found Jesus Christ? Praise him today. He is worthy. Jesus, we thank you for this season that we can celebrate your coming in the form of a child to become our risen King and our Savior. We thank you for dying on the cross for our sins and for showing us how to live this life in this world. And we look forward to the time when you're going to come again and you're going to take us to be with you in glory. We praise you for that and we thank you. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for being here today. I am reminded after listening to the worship team sing twice this morning, I had the privilege of listening to them in the 8 a.m. service and as again in this service, and I'm reminded of the diversity of our congregation and the glory of Christ and how Christ is working in all of our hearts and lives. This morning, we've heard someone from Albania, someone from Brazil. We have people in our church from Hungary. We have people from Europe. We have people from different parts of Latin America and people from all over the United States. As we continue a series of messages we started last week entitled, Rediscovering Christmas. Now, I'm preaching to the choir in a lot of this, but for some of us, we need to be reminded about what God's gift to humanity really is. I Googled a couple of days ago the gifts that would be most prominent in 2021, and I came across a website. Don't go to it right now. It's called bestproducts.com, and I am not endorsing this website because I didn't explore it enough to know what kind of products they might sell. But they did say this, 61% of Americans in 2021 want something that is very traditional as a Christmas gift. And then they said the most traditional Christmas gift that anyone could give in 2021 is a Christmas card with cash. Cash makes everything better, doesn't it? It is that gift that all of us know how to ascribe tangible meaning to it. But I want to point you to a text in the New Testament. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. For those of, us, for those of you who are following me in the Bible provided for you, I believe this is page 968. But the Apostle Paul wrote 15 verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. This is the second letter that he's written to the Corinthian church. And he's written to them about giving. I see some of you cringing already. I'm not going to be talking to you this morning about giving. I might suggest a few ways that you can be a blessing to the church. But this message is not about giving. It is about the gift that God has given to us in the person of Jesus Christ I don't know about you, but I told the 8 a.m. service this morning that I am so very thankful that I can lay my head on the pillow tonight and know that I'm eternally secure. I remember years ago, I was uh, friends and had become close friends with a gentleman uh, in Atlanta who is from the Muslim uh, tradition. And I started studying about Islam. I taught a class on it in my church in Atlanta. And I'm reminded that even if you keep the five pillars of Islam, the Shahada, and say that I believe in Allah and that Muhammad is his prophet, or even if I practice Salat and pray and Sakhad and give my alms. And even if I participate in Zalm and fasting during Ramadan, and even if I'm lucky enough to participate in what is known as the Hajj, which is a pilgrimage to Mecca, there is no sense of eternal security and no abiding peace that God is pleased with me. But I know that in the Christian teaching, Jesus Christ is God's incredible gift. And Paul picks up on this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 because Paul is reminding these individuals of the gift that he's asking them to give for the struggling church in Jerusalem. Now, I want to pause for just a moment, and I want to put 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15 within its biblical and its historical context. You may remember that in the late 40s AD, there was a a great famine that spread across all of Palestine, and the Christians in Jerusalem were greatly impacted by that. You know what that lets me know? That lets me know that Christians in the ancient Israel world and the Christians in the ancient first century uh, Palestine and Christians today and Christians all over the world suffer. Sometimes we experience famine, and sometimes we experience trials and tests that seem to only come to those who don't know God, but we know that there was a trial. And Paul wrote to the churches, and he said, I want you all to give an offering so that the brothers and the sisters in Jerusalem are well taken care of. And so the church of Antioch sent money to Jerusalem by the hands of Saul, who was later called Paul, and by a man by the name of Barnabas. The pillars of the early church, James, John, 
And uh, Peter told Paul, if we're going to send you forth, we want to make sure that you are generous and that you take care of the poor. Paul says, I'm not only willing to take care of the poor and to give them financial means, but I want to preach the gospel to them. And so Paul told the church about this in 1 Corinthians, and they didn't get it. You know, most of us don't get it, do we? We're hard-hearted, we're hard-headed, we're stuck on our ways, we want it my way. We're just a bunch of self-centered people. And that's why God has very little to work with when he chooses us as his emissaries, as his agents, as his ambassadors to go into all the world. But that is why he has to give you grace. And that's why he has to give me even more grace. Because, you know, we're just finite individuals who don't always want to cooperate with God. And so Paul writes to them again in 2 Corinthians, and he's admonishing them to be generous. People who don't want to give, you can't make them give. People who want to give, you can't stop them from giving. And Paul says, I just want you to know something. I just want you to know that I'm talking to you about giving, but I want to talk to you more about the gift that God has given humanity. And the last verse of 1st, 2nd Corinthians 9, the 15th verse of the 9th chapter of 2nd Corinthians says this, thanks be to God for his inexpressible, his indescribable uh, gift. Now, Paul uses a word in 2nd Corinthians 9, 15, that he only uses in this passage. This, this verse, this word is not seen in any of Paul's other writings. It's not found in any other passage in all the 66 books of the Bible. It's not even used in Greek antiquity. It was not a word that was common in the Greek culture. So Paul coined this phrase. Now, I want you to think about Paul, this tremendous theologian, this tremendous scholar who was a pastor, and he was an evangelist, and he cared for the souls of humanity, but he wanted to get this right. So he coined this phrase, and he says, you know, I was trained at the feet of Gamaliel. I know Hebrew, I know Greek, I know Aramaic, I know the law, I understand the Torah, I get it, but... When I think about Jesus Christ, and when I think about the gift that God has given to me, and that God has given to humanity, I can't think of a word to describe it. Jesus Christ is indescribable. That's what Paul says. But he's indescribable, but I want you to know something. Are you listening? Say amen. amen. He might be indescribable, but he is available. He might be indescribable, but he's receivable. He might be indescribable, but he's understandable. He might be indescribable, but he's memorable because of the work of the Holy Spirit who has the primary responsibility of making Jesus known in Randy's heart and making Jesus known in your heart and making Jesus known throughout all of the world. The Holy Spirit will make the indescribable gift of Jesus Christ more than known, more than receivable. And Paul is saying that this gift is so indescribable, we've got to wrap our minds around this. Did you know Paul spoke about Jesus in every one of his letters? He never just wrote a letter to a church just to be a pen pal to a congregation in the first century. No, Paul always had a mission. His mission was to make Christ known and to know God. You know, theologians and scholars tell us that the Apostle Paul was probably about five foot six or about five foot seven. That makes me feel real good about myself because I'm five foot nine with my socks on. <laughs> He was bald-headed, I'm not there yet. <laughs> he was beady-eyed, and he was extremely focused on his task. Probably a type A personality. Scholars tell us that the Apostle Paul probably would have made a lot of his contemporaries uncomfortable around him. He was one of these kind of guys that he was so devoted to his task, if you weren't going to buy in, you could just move on because he had a work to do. 
and he had a mission to accomplish. And can you not see this coming out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9 as he puts this pen to parchment and he begins to ink out on this papyra, this theology of giving. He said, I just want you to know the only reason we can give is because God has first given to us. Now we need to stop this morning and I want us to think about something. We're now in the second week of Advent. I was at the mall yesterday, the day before, and the day before that. I love walking around the mall. I love going to Starbucks. I love to see the crowds. I love people. If I had it my way, I'd live right in the middle of Manhattan and Times Square. But that's not a reality because my wife said no. <laughs> and I've often, I've learned something. Dean and I will celebrate our 27th wedding anniversary this Friday, and I've learned something. I've learned something that God's will and his direction often comes through what my wife tells me to do. <laughs> I love being in the hustle and the bustle. I'm an extrovert. I get energized and charged when I'm around people. And when I think about what Paul is saying here, Paul is saying that we have a problem in our culture and we have a problem in society because we have forgotten about this indescribable gift. I want you to think about something. You can go to Harvard today and all of these Ivy League schools and you can acquire a tremendous education. And if you can get in and go there, I would recommend that you go. But you can walk out of there educated, but none the more wiser because you'll know nothing about Jesus Christ unless you place your faith in him. And all that this world has to offer, it cannot answer the basic questions of life. Do you know what they are? Do you ever ponder this? Where did we come from? Where are we going? What gives us purpose? And what is the meaning of morality? Those are the deep questions that we have to think through in life. And the indescribable gift of Jesus Christ answers all of these questions cohesively and coherently. And that is one of many, many reasons why we can believe in Christ. But Jesus said something like this in the New Testament. He said, you know, you think those who have seen me are blessed. Blessed are those who do not see me and yet they believe. If you will believe on Christ right now, that is, you'll accept him as the only sin payment that can save you for eternity and remove all of your guilt and stain. If by faith you'll cast yourselves upon Jesus Christ by the authority of Jesus' words, I can tell you, you will be blessed and highly favored. You want to leave here today blessed and highly favored? Believe on Jesus because he said, blessed is he who believes and who has never seen Randy, how do I do that? Through the eyes of faith, you look to him. And when you do, you're going to be receiving a gift that is profound. Can I tell you a little bit about the gift this morning as we prepare our hearts for communion? First of all, I want you to know about the gift of pardon, the gift of pardon, the gift of forgiveness. Every one of us in here needs this profound gift. I want to direct your attention to Ecclesiastes chapter 7 in verse 20. Surely there's not a righteous man on earth who does good and who never sins. You may say, well, that's the problem. That is exactly the problem with the culture in which we live. If you ask sociologists, and I'm not against that discipline of social science, I've studied social science. I've written papers in social science. It's not a bad discipline at all. But scientists in the social setting will say, well, what's wrong with mankind is that mankind just needs better schools and better housing and better economic opportunities. And those things in and of themselves are true, but they don't point to the deep abiding problem of humanity, which is the problem of sin. Sin is everywhere. In fact, if you read in Genesis 6, 5, when God looked out over the world, all he saw was wickedness and ungodliness. I hate to uh, take the wind out of your cell, but when God chose you and when he chose me, he didn't have a whole lot to work with. That's why he gives grace, and that's why he gives power. Can I tell you what kind of grace and power he gives? Turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 23. 
And I want you to listen to these words written by the Apostle Paul. He says this, beginning in verse 23, that all have sinned, that is, everyone, and has fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ, whom God put forth as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. And this was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. Romans 3.23 gives you a theology of sin and it gives you a theology of redemption. Redemption means to be rescued. Redemption means to be saved. It means to be purchased. There are other words in the New Testament that the biblical writers use to convey these theological truths. But do you see this in the text? It tells us that all have sinned. Every man, woman, boy, and girl. There is no not one who has ever kept the law, who has ever sought God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and body. You're not saved based on your Perfection. You're saved based on the perfection of Jesus Christ. And Paul uses this term to explain what it means to have the gift of pardon. He uses the term justification. It is a legal term. In Paul's day, it was an accounting term. In Paul's day, it would have been equivalent to a farmer going to the bank, even though they didn't have banks in those days. We'll use that metaphor as a way of bridging the gap between the first century and our own. The farmer goes to the banker and the farmer owes a lot of money. He's had a bad year. His yield of crop didn't come through. He's in debt. He can't pay the debt. And some neighbor finds out about it and he goes to the banker and he says, I know the banker owes you $500,000. I'm going to take care of that. Just put that debt on my account. The farmer was justified even though he had a debt to pay. When God justifies you, he justifies you based on the work of Christ on the cross. This is why Paul says, when I think about this, that God sent his son into the world. That's what the text says, by the way. The text says that God sent him into the world. This was part of God's divine initiative. This was part of God's plan. The cross was part of God's plan. And on the cross, God took care of the sins of humanity. And we appropriate the finished work of the cross when we, by faith, receive Christ and we receive pardon. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but what? The gift, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It does not come through Joseph Smith, it does not come through Muhammad. It does not come through Buddha. It does not come through the plethora of gods in Hinduism. It doesn't come through the North American concept of morality. It doesn't come by attending church. It doesn't come by giving money. It doesn't come by avoiding sin. This gift comes as a result of placing our faith in the person of Jesus Christ. Most of you have done that this morning, but maybe like me, you're like the church at Corinth and a second time you need somebody to share this with you. That's what Paul is doing. If you read about the church at Corinth, particularly in the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul identified them as saints, yet they were living in sin that they had embraced from a cultural perspective. They needed their perspective changed. And Paul says, the only way that your perspective can be changed, it's not through pop psychology. It's not through thinking yourself positively. It's through embracing the person of Jesus Christ. It's through the indescribable gift known as Jesus Christ. And this gift of pardon is yours free today. And with the pardon comes the next gift. And that is the gift of peace. This is what Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. One of the most profound passages in all of the New Testament. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not talking about just the peace of God. We're talking about peace with God. Most people are not at peace with God. Most people right now might be free from difficulties, but they're not at peace with God. 
Here's how you and I have peace with God. By faith, we embrace Christ and we cast ourselves upon his mercies. That is the only way we're going to have peace with God. This peace is not subjective. It is objective. This peace is not a feeling. This peace is a fact. It is based on the authority of the New Testament. It is based on the historical fact that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, conceived in a virgin's womb by the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ was born like you were born. He doodled in his diapers like you doodled in your diapers. He needed his mother and father's care and protection like you need your mother's care and protection. Jesus Christ experienced growing pains. Jesus Christ went through everything that we could ever imagine, but there's one qualifying difference. He never sinned. I was reading through the Gospels recently in my own reading, and I came across something that I've read many times, but I've really not thought about it. And it was the verse that said, there was no guile in Jesus' mouth and no deceit was found in him. My heart has been deceptive many times. Words have come from my mouth more times than not that bring reproach against the name of the Lord. Yet here's Jesus Christ who never even once spoke a word that was even remotely offensive to God. He lived a perfect life. And that is why you and I can have peace with him. Our peace is based on the perfect life, the perfect death, the perfect resurrection, the perfect ascension, and the perfect mediatorial role that Christ has for us today. That is why our peace is objective. You have to know this. That is why you have to base your faith upon facts and not upon feelings. Those of us in the Pentecostal charismatic tradition have a tendency to be a little too much emotional and a little too touchy-feely. And we are emotional and there's nothing wrong with that. But we can't build our faith around how we feel. And we can't build our faith around how we think that we are doing in the sight of God. We have to always remember the promise that God gave to Abraham. He said to Abraham, if you will believe me, Abraham, I will give you my righteousness. Are you willing to believe Christ today? Have you already believed Christ today? If you have believed in him, that means you have the righteousness of Christ given to your account. That is why you and I are at peace. So this indescribable gift, it is a gift of pardon. It is a gift of peace. But it is also a gift of purpose. We're always trying to go through life trying to figure out why we were created. This is not rocket science, and it's not difficult. Let me point you to a passage of Scripture in the New Testament found in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, beginning in verse 8 and following. This is what we read in one of the great letters that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. This is the only letter that Paul wrote where he wasn't dealing with a specific problem. Galatians, there was a problem. In 1 and 2 Corinthians, there were a myriad of problems. But in the book of Ephesians, Paul is reminding these believers of what has happened to them. In other words, he's not telling them how to be saved. He's telling them that they are saved and that they're saved based on the finished work of Christ. So beginning in verse 8 of Ephesians chapter 2, we read these words, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of your work, so that no man may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared in beforehand that we should walk in them. Do you see the natural progression of Paul's logic? Paul is telling these believers, wait just a minute. You're saved not based on what you have done, are doing, or could ever do. You're based on the fact that Jesus Christ died for you. God gave you grace, and you appropriated that by faith, and you have no room to boast unless you're boasting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Paul says, 
good works never result in salvation, but your salvation should be followed by good works. Jesus referred to this as bearing fruit. We're living in a day and time where people are quick to say, don't judge me. Did you know that we have the responsibility in the body of Christ to help other believers to mature and grow in their life? How do we do that? By discerning whether or not they're manifesting fruit in their life. Are you bearing fruit? Am I bearing fruit? Fruit bearing is the primary way to bring glory to God. I don't want us to get off on this subject and there's nothing in your notes and there's not going to be anything on the screen, but Jesus spoke a lot about this in John 14 and 15. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you don't abide in me, you're not going to do anything. But if you abide in me as I am abiding in the Father, you're going to bear much fruit. And when you bear fruit, you're going to bring glory and honor to the Father. See, this all works together. And this is what Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 2, and particularly in verse 10. He says that we've been saved by the grace of God, and we appropriate this by faith. And that when we appropriate this by faith, the Holy Spirit works in us to accomplish God's perfect will. The word that Paul uses that is translated in the English text as workmanship, it is, it is the word poeme from which we get the word poem. In other words, God is constructing a work of literature in your life. Or to use more artistic euphemisms, he is... He is hewing from a stone a work of art, a masterpiece. And he's not done with you yet. Nothing, in my opinion, and my opinion might be different than yours, and your opinion might be better than mine, but nothing in my estimation is more repugnant, more aggravating, <laughs> more obnoxious than to be around someone who thinks that they are above someone else, particularly in the body of Christ. I have discovered, not because I've lived it out, but through observing other people, that the most godly among us are those who are the most humble among us and who are the best servants among us. They recognize their inadequacies. They recognize their failures. They recognize their sins. They recognize their shortcomings. They recognize, but by the grace of God, there go I. They stay humble before the Lord, and the Lord accomplishes in them and through them his perfect work, will, and plan. I want you to remember something today. God has created you for his purposes. You say, well, how does that translate into who I marry? I don't know. I think God would say, as long as you honor me and as long as the person you're honoring will marry, but you need to be aware of their personalities that they're probably not gonna change. Can, can you deal with that for the rest of your life? You know, God does give us common sense. He gives us a little wisdom. Where should I go to school? Well, I would say go wherever you get accepted and apply yourself and get that degree and study as hard as you can. Well, where should I take a job? Well, I don't know, pray about that, but let me give you a general rule of thumb. It probably don't matter. Just go get a job and work and bring God glory, honor in the process. And at the end of the day, you will be his workmanship created in Christ Jesus in order to please him. And that's what he's going to do in your life. You see, this gift that he has given us through Christ wasn't just something that happened way back yonder on a cross. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And at a specific moment in time, and I'm going to be preaching about this, Lord willing, in two Sundays from today, at a specific point in history, at God's appointed time, at that explicit and prophetic predetermined sovereign time on the prophetic timeline, Jesus Christ was manifested in the person of a man, 
But from the foundations of the world, the plan of salvation was accomplished. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He was manifested in the person of Christ. He was crucified and died and raised from the dead. And as a result, when you and I believe in him, he saves us. And he gives us the Holy Spirit to accomplish his will. So let me ask you a question. The question is not, do you have it right about who you're going to marry? The question is not, do you have it right about what job you're going to take? The question is not, how am I going to make the decision tomorrow morning that's going to result in me making the right investments on the stock market? The question is, have you made the main decision, the right decision? And that is that I am going to place my faith in Christ and I'm going to live for him and him alone. That's the undergirding question that we have to get right. Because when we get that right, you know what happens? We receive forgiveness. We're pardoned. We have peace that passeth all understanding. Not that everything's going to go well. Not every prayer is going to be answered. You probably will still come down with a cold or a flu or a stomach virus even after you place yourself in the hands of Jesus Christ but you're going to be pardoned. You're going to have peace. You're going to know your purpose. And I'm going to tell you what else is going to happen in your life. You're going to experience a different perspective. It is the gift of perspective. Wasn't it last Sunday that I mentioned to the congregation that we needed a good theology of perspective and that we needed to allow the gospel to reorient the way we think about life? I think I encouraged all of you to begin to measure everything you do against the backdrop of Scripture and to sift everything in life through the framework of what the Bible has to say. Because the gift of perspective is something that God gives us when we place our faith in Christ. Study the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus said, Master, Can a man go back into the womb of his mother and be born again? Jesus said, Nicodemus, that is not what I'm talking about when I say you must be born again. You must be born again by the Spirit. And then he says, the Spirit is like the wind. And you can't tell if the wind's coming from the north or the south or the east or the west, but you feel it and you know it's present. And that's what happens when you and I come to Christ We can't exactly explain everything, but we know something is going on and we begin to see things differently. I want to suggest something to you. If you're not sensing and seeing things from a different perspective, i.e., the perspective of Jesus Christ, I would really caution you as to whether or not you're saved. You say, Pastor, how dare you judge me? No, I'm not judging you. I'm simply admonishing you to do some introspection. The Apostle Paul says that we are to grow in grace and the fear of the Lord with, with, with trembling. That is to examine ourselves to know whether or not we're even in the faith or not. Because when we're in the faith, we're going to have a totally different gift of perspective. Let me direct your attention very quickly this morning to Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 20. Paul says this, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, no longer I live, but Christ lives in me in the life that I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. Do you know what Paul was like prior to knowing Christ? He was like me and he was like you, self-centered, selfish, cocky, arrogant, pompous. Someone once told me that the most difficult person that you could ever witness to is a religious person who thinks that God owes them a favor and that they are A-OK with God without realizing that apart from Christ, we are enemies of God. That's what we are. We're enemies of God. You're not going to get that in the world. You're not going to get that teaching by reading Time Magazine or U.S. News and World Report. You're not going to get that by reading the Palm Beach Post. You're not going to get that through reading secular literature. But the New Testament is very clear that if we're not in Christ, we are enemies of God. I don't know about you, but I don't want God to be my enemy. 
And I don't have to be an enemy with God because he gave me a gift known as the person of Christ to reconcile me to him. And now no longer I am an enemy, but now I am his child. That is the perspective that I now have because Christ has changed my identity and he's changed my perspective. And not only has he changed my perspective toward him, he's changing in an ongoing way my perspective toward others. If you don't love the church, you don't love Christ. If you don't love sinners, you don't love Christ. If you don't love a perishing world, you don't love Christ. I didn't say you weren't saved. I didn't say you weren't going to heaven. I didn't say you weren't eternally secure. I'm just simply saying something's out of sync. And you wanna know what? The more we draw close to Christ, here's what happens. We recognize as Paul did, Paul says, I no longer live this life based on what I want. In other words, Jesus' faith is good enough for me. His life was good enough for me. His death was good enough for me. I'm going to rest in the faith of Jesus Christ. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's interceding for me. When I'm depressed, when I'm anxious, when I'm angry, when I'm mad, when I'm hurt, when I'm disappointed, when I'm sad, when I don't know what to do, I'm going to rest in the faith of Jesus Christ. This is why if we trust him, we have nothing to fear. This is why if we trust him, we can know that we know that we know that not only is heaven going to be our home, but everything on this side of eternity is going to check out okay. I'm not telling you to go through life flippant. I'm not telling you to shun common sense and never plan. I'm just simply saying to you that if you place your faith in Christ and you cast yourself upon him, he's going to care for you. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to give you power. He's going to give you the gift of power. Not only the gift of perspective, but he's going to give you the gift of power. And this gift of power that I'm talking to you about this morning is the gift to change. You're here today and you have addictions in your life that no one knows about but you and God. It is possible for you to fool your spouse. It is possible for you to deceive your spouse. It is possible for you to deceive your small group leader. It is possible for you to deceive your pastor. And it's very possible for all of us to deceive ourselves. I don't trust in my own self. I have confidence that I can do things as long as I'm putting God first. But my heart, like your heart, has a tendency to wonder, has a tendency to stray off course. This is why I need the word in my life on a daily basis, because I find myself desiring things that are outside of the contours of God's word. Sometimes I find myself scribbling outside the lines and I need a power that is greater than personality. I need a power that is greater than desire and I need a power that's greater than my dreams. Nowhere in the Bible are we told to pursue our dreams. We're told to pursue Christ. And here's what happens. It's the same thing that happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. In Acts chapter 9, verse 6, Luke gives us that conversion experience. When Paul was on the road to Damascus, his name was Saul. He was pompous, arrogant. He was a Pharisee. He kept the law. He was religious. He was persecuting the church. And he thought that he was obeying God and doing the church a favor. And Jesus went to him like Jesus comes to us, and he knocked Paul off of his horse. And Paul said to him, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? And the Lord said, if you'll arise and go into the city, I'll show you what you must do. Let me throw this out there to you this morning. When you receive the gift by faith and humility, here's how you can know that you are pursuing God. When you say to him, Lord, who are you? And what is it that you want me to do? Because you see, that is a sign of a surrendered life. That is a sign of someone who has been willing to be made willing. Someone who's humble enough to recognize that I need the Lord in my life. And when you ask the Lord, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? 
He will move heaven and earth in order to show you what it is that he wants you to do. Now, the question is, what are you going to do if he tells you to do something you don't want to do? <laughs> now, what if you already know what it is you're supposed to do and you're not willing to do it? You're doing the same thing Paul was doing. Jesus says you're kicking against the goads. That's the way it's described in the English Standard Version. The goads were a, were a stick or a rod with, with sticks on the end that would be used to goad the sheep or the goats or the cattle. Paul says, I've been kicking against this. No wonder my life hasn't been going right. No wonder things aren't the way they ought to be. I've been kicking against the goads, but now I'm going to turn my life over to the Lord. So this morning, in just a moment, we're going to share in communion together. Can I tell you what communion is? You're part of this church, you ought to know by now, but let me just once again remind you. Communion is a sacrament. It's holy, it's special. It was implemented by our Lord and given to the church so that the body of Christ could come together and they could remember the gift. They could appropriate the grace that has been given to us in Christ and that we would anticipate the return of our Lord. You know, earlier I said to you that even though the gift of Christ is indescribable, the gift is available. This morning, if I were you, I would take God at his word and I would receive by faith the available gift. I said to you that the indescribable gift is not only available but believable. The Holy Spirit will give you grace to believe. I told you that the gift was indescribable but that it was receivable. You can receive right now Christ. You say, Pastor, I know him, I'm saved. Well, you still need to receive his grace and you need to receive his mercy. Some of you might even need to receive his forgiveness this morning for unconfessed sins. The gift is indescribable, but it's memorable. And that's why God has given us communion so that we can remember what happened. You know, we're doing three things in just a moment. We're looking back to when Christ was crucified. In the moment, we're looking to him to receive grace. How many of you need that grace this morning? And we're looking forward with anticipation to the second coming of our Lord. That is what we are about to do. And I would encourage everyone in here to participate. You do not need to be a member of our church to share in communion. The only prerequisite is that you have placed your faith in Christ, that you know that you're saved because of what Jesus did for you. If that is true for you, then you qualify this morning to share in communion. Some of you come from a church that might refer to this as the Lord's Supper. Some of you come from a tradition that calls this the Eucharist. It's a time of celebration, but it's also a time of contemplation. So I'm going to ask you, while the ushers and those who are serving this morning come very quickly to prepare to serve you, I'm gonna ask you if you would bow your head now and allow the Lord to search your heart and to speak to you. I would encourage you to talk to the Lord this morning. I would encourage you to thank the Lord for his indescribable gift. Thank him for his grace and thank him for his mercy. Thank him for his kindness. Yes, 
sing. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. Oh Lord, I bring an offering to you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23, Paul says, For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat the bread together as we remember the body of Christ. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup. In doing so, you're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Let us drink together. It has been a delight to be with you today in the house of the Lord on the Lord's day. Thank you for being here. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. And may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now unto him who's able to keep you, hallelujah, and to present you before his glorious throne without sin, fear, guilt, or condemnation. The devil will condemn you. People will convict you. But the Lord will always be there for you. His name is Jesus. A sinner Savior. Son of God, Son of Man. And soon coming King. Go live for him today. Psalms 1914 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Would you lift your voices to the Lord and join in with the praise team? And let's sing ourselves out of here today. God bless you. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week on our website, crosscommunity.cc, and on our Facebook and Instagram pages. You can find us at Cross Community Church. As a group of God's people, we care about you and your family. And we're here not only to feed you spiritually, but to help in any way we can. So if you need pastoral care or have any prayer requests, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you again for being with us today and have a fantastic week.